Welcome to the Deep End Beyond Deck, a podcast where visionary builders, creators, and experts discuss world-changing ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kosloff. Let's dive in. With the Deep End, we're creating space where we skip the surface level and go in-depth into ideas that matter. I'll be your guide as we explore possible futures of commerce, higher education, art, governance, longevity, and more with some of the most exciting figures in their respective fields. Joining me in the deep end is Candace Amori, Program Director of the On Deck Climate Tech Fellowship, a 10-week program for startup and climate experts looking to join, start, invest in, and advise climate tech companies. Today, Candace and I spoke about why she often describes climate tech as the paramount industry of our times and why climate tech was the first sector-focused program that On Deck launched. In the early 2000s, there was a big push for clean tech that was ultimately seen as a failure. But as Candace explains over the course of our conversation, a lot has changed since then. Drawing on the lessons from Clean Tech 1.0, climate tech today is much less dependent on policy changes. Underlying technological advances are reaching an inflection point at the same time as we are seeing a massive infusion of talent and investment into the climate tech ecosystem. So even as the underlying climate crisis becomes more urgent, climate tech is undergoing a renaissance of energy, talent, and capital. But time is short to build solutions. As we discuss, the key unlocking in the industry would be the development of climate tech that could significantly reduce global carbon emissions by the 2030s, not the 2050s. You can learn more about the On Deck Climate Tech Fellowship at beyonddeck.com slash climate. For more information about the fellowship, show notes, previous episodes, and more, go to this episode's show notes in your podcast player, click the link to the Deep End Substack, and hit subscribe. It's thedeepend.substack.com. The Deep End is produced by On Deck, where top talent goes to accelerate their ideas and careers. We hope that those who listen to the ideas on the show are inspired to build. To learn more about On Deck's programs, visit beyonddeck.com. For show notes and additional resources related to the deep end, check out ideas.beyonddeck.com. All right, let's dive in. Candace Amori, welcome to the deep end. Thank you for having me, Marshall. You've said in a previous podcast appearance with Eric Torenberg that you think that climate change and the broad stuff under the climate tech field are the paramount issues of our time. But what's interesting about climate change is this has effectively always been the paramount issue, whether it's the year 1993, if it's 2007, or if it's today. So since we're speaking around tech investment businesses that are coming up in this space, what about this specific moment makes us an ideal opportunity to focus on this space? Great question. The first answer is we haven't solved it yet. And so we have just punted it year after year. And it was important in 1993. It's just as and way more important today because we are running against the clock. And so that's why when it comes to technical innovation, it's so important to have a sense of urgency and a bias for action here. And as hard as we can, try to get the solutions out by 2030 instead of by 2050. And so it's a really urgent problem. And that's number one. Number two is we're seeing these market dynamics that make it actually really favorable to start a company today in climate tech. So one is there's just this influx of money the amount of money in VC and climate has 40 x in the last less than 10 years. Um, it's going to continue growing and it's, it's the fastest growing sector. There's also an influx of money from institutional uh, money sources, from foundations. It's just there's so much money in this space. There's a maturing ecosystem of incubators, accelerators that are all trying to help companies not only start, but also build, scale, make bigger impact. So ecosystem is maturing. That's really great for founders and for people coming into this space. There's also, for people who are less interested in startups and more interested in corporations, and we need people who are interested in every part of the solution. So there's no one place that's better or another. But there's this explosion of corporate commitments. And really, that reflects this growing interest from consumers, um, from investors, from investors 
you know, people who want to have ESG funds moving forward. So all these corporations are committing to working on climate in some way. A lot of them are using net zero commitments, which I hope that we talk about. Um, but that's another place that people can get involved. And that's another, another piece of the ecosystem that we see today. Uh, the last piece on the investment side, and a lot of this is thanks to Amy Dufour and, and Shale Khan talking about this recently. But the last thing is there's all this hype around SPACs and MI, MNAs, and it's just easier for entrepreneurs to raise more money faster and, and exit. So from an entrepreneurial perspective, that's why it's really exciting. And that's why it's a great space to be in um, beyond just <laughs> the excitement and the personal fulfillment of knowing that you're making an actual real difference on the future of the planet and the future of every species on this planet, including humanity. There's so much to unpack there. Thanks for the really meaty answer. But first, what is an ESG fund? ESG, so that is Environmental Social Governance. And that's what it stands for. And it's this idea that we should be measuring our um, the stock options that we want to buy, not only based on their financial returns, but also based on how they measure up on environmental, social, and governance metrics. So there's this whole industry, actually, that's starting right now that's, that's really blooming, and it started really with a lot of women in finance who wanted to take this area seriously. And um, more and more, especially young people, are looking to, to make sure that their 401ks and every investment that they make is in companies that align with their values around ESG. Something I'm wondering about regarding your answer about we haven't solved it yet. Going back to the 1990s, I'm curious what you mean and who you mean by we. Does we mean that policymakers haven't corrected for market failures like the lack of a price on carbon through policy? Is it that investors haven't focused on the space enough? Is it that founders, scientists, et cetera, haven't innovated enough? Define what the failure is exactly and the different categories of persons that I may or may not have listed. That is a good, complex, rich question. So you talked about policy, investors, consumers. We didn't talk about corporations and the web of lies that fossil fuel companies spewed throughout that entire time, right? In the 70s, they knew that there was going to be a problem. And um, they will admit today behind closed doors and more and more in front of closed doors um, or in open doors that, that they lied. And so, you know, that's one area where we didn't actually make a difference. Policy, absolutely. I mean, we have been trying to get a carbon price for years. And at this point, once we actually implement a policy or a policy of a, of a carbon tax or a carbon price, which you know, Europe and all these other areas have actually done already we're probably past that making much of a difference. So the, the carbon tax, the carbon price is absolutely a place where we failed. Cap and trade in 2007, 2008, that also failed. So that was a place where we could make a difference in policy. Really thinking about like R&D on new technology, that's another policy failure. We just didn't put enough money behind not only testing out moonshots and new technologies, but also behind underwriting some of the financial um, upfront costs of solar, for example. And we did some of that during the Obama administration and underwriting the upfront financial costs was a huge win for the entire economy, but, but we only did that fairly recently. So those are some pieces on the policy side. And then briefly just on the investment side, I think there's so much opportunity for new types of financial instruments in the climate tech space, where if we think about climate being this urgent problem, it actually needs more patient capital. Um, so that's another place. And <laughs> the last place, because you mentioned all these, these places, consumers. I firmly believe that you and I, Marshall, as individuals, should not feel guilty for the climate crisis. Like there's no, that, that doesn't help anyone, right? Like big oil companies came up with the idea of a carbon footprint. So you and I could figure out what our carbon footprint is and feel bad about it. Feel bad about taking trips with our parents or drinking bottled water when that's the only option that we have. Actually, like instead of thinking about reducing our, our footprint, which is a fine exercise and there are probably ways that we can be less extravagant as a whole, and we will have to be less extravagant as a whole most likely. But the bigger thing is how do we use our collective power, often in policy or activism, or um, even you know deciding what you wanna buy. All of those things are helping us now today focus more on things like ESG or um, you know corporations making these climate commitments that I think can be improved. But that wasn't happening for a while. We focused really on our individual footprint. And I think now there's, there's more of a focus on consumers changing things on a policy level and on a corporate level. 
I want to dive into that a little more for a second because I have some background in the space. So I know what you mean by the really unhelpful nature of focusing too much on the individual level, but just explain to the audience why that's actually sort of hamstrung progress or even approaches in the right space. How is that focus not particularly helpful? One thing that I try to imbue in every talk I give or or person I interview and everything I do is this bias for action. And to have a bias for action, I believe you need a sort of stubborn optimism that's based in realism, but also, also rooted in this conviction that no matter how bad it seems, we can take action that makes things better. And I believe that putting the onus of climate change on consumers does not help us have a bias for action. It actually makes us feel really shitty about ourselves, really guilty about ourselves. And ultimately, like, there's nothing that we can do as individuals because, you know, we can't change the energy source of our house. Electrifying an entire house takes literally a million dollars. The average person cannot do that. Right. And so I'm using energy from the grid. That's probably dirty. That's that's not my fault. And so what I think at a fundamental and sort of philosophical level, what it does is is take agency away from individuals because we don't we can't really change our our footprint all that much. Right. When COVID started and we thought, oh, my God, amazing, like we're going to use so much less energy now that we're not going into work and we're not driving as much. And overall, the energy didn't decrease all that much during COVID when people were on strict lockdown because so much of that energy and the you know, the things that contribute to climate change are just built into our infrastructure and that consumers have really no agency on at an individual level, but do have agency on when we band together and demand change. I totally get what you're saying about individual agency being unhelpful. At the same time, though, if we're talking about new technologies, products, companies, et cetera, obviously consumer desires are going to be really important there. So what role do you think consumer desire plays in developing new technologies or products or companies? So for example, there are a lot of consumers out there who probably like Beyond Meat, not because they have specific dietary restrictions, but because everyone knows, or not everyone, but a lot of consumers are aware of the fact that industrial farming and agriculture is an incredibly um, carbon intensive, inefficient process. So beyond meat can appeal to that. And if there were a market for large amounts of non organic meat, that would actually provide a method of reducing agricultural emissions. So can you just talk about the consumer side of it then? Policy and market regulate regulation creates markets for tech companies and it creates opportunities. And so let's let's take that as as an aside and we think about consumers being able to take agency. And I probably misspoke if it came across that consumers don't have any agency. I think the more important thing is that consumers shouldn't feel guilty for their lack of agency and the lack of ability to choose a different energy source from what they have in their current home. But consumers, everyone listening to this, has incredible amounts of agency in terms of choosing what to buy, choosing what stocks to buy as well, and to to put your 401k into, and actually getting educated on climate and local policy is a huge lever of agency there as well. But on the consumer side, absolutely. Like, you know, we are seeing this influx of money coming into climate tech, partially because we know it's a crisis, but more importantly, because we know it's a huge opportunity. Consumers are dying to get their hands on things that make them feel good about the environment, that make them feel like they're actually making a difference. And uh, a lot of that is is driving consumer demand in climate tech today. You spoke about the need for policy to set a price on carbon to deal with the various market failures. Before we go any further, can you just explain the policy argument that hypothetically, especially in the past, could have really shifted the dynamics around companies and technology in the space, especially when it comes to carbon pricing? At the the simplest level, a carbon tax or a carbon price would make it so that the external cost, it's called an externality in economics, right? This, the pollution, the carbon that's put out by, um, by not clean energy, right? By dirty energy. It's an externality. So it's not actually caught in the price of gas or oil. So we have a carbon tax or carbon price. Then that externality, externality is included in the price of that energy. So what that means is that instead of getting fossil fuel company subsidies, which we still do and we should stop doing, we increase the price of fossil fuels at the same time, solar, wind, 
all of these clean energies that already actually in a lot of places are cheaper than fossil fuels, even with, with the uh, distribution of subsidies, those would have been a much better economic choice. And the sort of free market of having dirty energy be priced appropriately and clean energy be priced appropriately would mean that we would make a shift toward clean energy much earlier than we did. And luckily, the economics are still in our favor. Clean energy and solar is reducing at incredible, incredible rates every single year. There are all these, like every prediction 20 years ago about how cheap solar would get is off by magnitudes. It's so much cheaper today than, than anyone ever thought. And Department of Energy is forecasting through 2030 believes that it'll be two cents a kilowatt hour industrially, three cents commercially, five cents residentially. That is incredible. That's so cheap. And that gives me a lot of hope. So something you spoke about during your episode of Eric and people really focus on in the field was this idea during the first clean tech boom in the early 2000s was this idea that there was going to be some form of carbon pricing coming down the pipeline to mix metaphors way too often here. That never came. So what role did optimism about a price play in the first clean tech boom? It played a huge role. So if there are two big themes from clean tech 1.0 and why it failed, one of those two, I would argue, is is banking on a legislation legislation that was never passed. And that was carbon tax, carbon price, essentially having the business model of whatever these investors were financing, whatever these startups um, were that were coming out. Part of that core business model relied on a different policy. And investors today have actually learned not to do that. Like so many investors in the climate space explicitly say your business model has to work with the current policy framework and regulatory framework. We will not invest in you if you require anything that isn't passed today. The other thing that I think is really interesting was that there was a two thousand early 2000.com bust where investors just like had all this extra money and nowhere to put it and thought, great, energy is probably this huge market. I can make a lot of money. Let's put our money there without doing due diligence, I think, on a larger scale of what, what is energy? What sort of investments should I be making? Um, what is it like to invest in a hardware company versus a software company? So we had a lot of a lot of money that just didn't understand the entire industry. And I think during the climate tech era, people are being a lot more slow and a lot more deliberate about learning what climate tech even means and how to invest well in this space um, and how to really get educated or at least partner with people who are incredibly educated in the space. So those those would be the two biggest um, two biggest learnings from clean tech 1.0 is don't bank on legislation that may not pass and get smart about the industry. So to put it in clear terms, it seems that what you're suggesting is that in 2005, there were probably a lot of slide decks that probably had a section on the fact that there would be a cap and trade bill coming down the line, which would mean that you would need to have demand for all these different fills. But that's very much not the dynamic today, which is just interesting because to your point at the start of the podcast, the situation has only grown worse. So that's a very complicated dynamic. So something I'm curious about, though, is you referred to clean tech as a failure. However, within your point earlier, you said that solar, other forms of renewable energy have only gotten better over the past 20 years. So how do you define failure from the perspective of the companies that people were focusing on back then? At a high level, overall, most of those companies failed. Um, and if we think about going back to the Obama administration's um, like the money that they put into clean tech, the, the successes were more in subsidizing the cost of or underwriting the cost of projects, especially in solar. And so Solar City is, is an example of a company that essentially helps with the high upfront costs of putting solar on your roof. Because once you put solar on your roof, it's, it's free energy, essentially, right? But that upfront cost is prohibited for so much of the market. How expensive so, is it? I have no idea, but it's expensive. Yeah. Like, you know, only people in white wealthy, very often only people in white wealthy neighborhoods or, you know, churches that have pulled, pulled a lot of their money together is able to afford it. Um, it's getting cheaper, but it's only possible or it's mostly possible because you're able to break up that initial high cost into smaller amounts that people can actually afford. And without that, solar's price wouldn't have gone down. It's, it's economics, right? It's, it's the economies of scale. We wouldn't have those economies of scale if we didn't have financial tools to lower that price. 
And so it's definitely not a failure. I mean, that is fucking huge. Solar and wind and, and clean energy's prices have really gone down and made a huge dent and difference across the world. But if we think about it from like a VC perspective and like a from an entrepreneurial perspective of starting new technologies and scaling those technologies, it was a fairly big failure. Obama administration also backed a lot of early companies where there was a ton of risk. And that's where most of the failures were. And today we don't want to see those failures, right? We want to still back those moonshots and those big technologies and have a lower rate of failure than we did then. But at the same time, Tesla came out of that funding and Tesla is like this incredibly massive hit. So maybe we only need one incredibly massive hit to scale and make a big impact for it to not be a failure. So I probably shouldn't call it a failure. Something we haven't hit on, but you've discussed in other places is that a key part of the clean tech focus was just on this idea of efficiency. Can you talk a little bit around that idea and what we've learned from that focus and how what we're really looking through today and discussing today in the context of climate change, how the conversation has shifted away from purely efficiency? Efficiency, I would put under reducing carbon emissions. And that's still incredibly important. It's, it's the larger bu bucket of mitigation, if we think about climate. So mitigation, which is reducing our carbon emissions that are new carbon emissions that go out into the world. We have this other big bucket called resilience and adaptation, which is this idea that we're already facing the climate crisis today. It's going to take tr like literally trillions of dollars to be able to adapt to the changes that are already going to happen. If we stopped emitting carbon today, we would still have to spend trillions of dollars to be able to, to be resilient to the things that are going to happen. So we have mitigation efficiency, we have resilience and adaptation. And now there's this third bucket that's getting a lot of attention, which is generally carbon removal. Sometimes people will call it or, or conflate it with offsets. They're very separate in my mind. But this industry really grew after the IPCC report in 2018 came out saying that we want to stick to 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. It's probably impossible at this point. We probably can stick with two, two degrees Celsius warming. But I believe in either case, we actually need to remove some of the carbon that's already in the air and permanently sequester it. So put it somewhere where it's permanently not going to go back into the air. And, uh, and so today we still have a fairly large emphasis on efficiency um, and really mitigation. So new technologies that emit less carbon or, or emit zero carbon under mitigation, we have less of a focus on resilience and adaptation and a bigger focus on carbon removal. I'm really interested in the discourse around carbon removal because I remember back in the 2000s, the whole idea of clean coal was really, really controversial. And many folks in the climate change space saw it as industry's attempt to push aside action in the climate space in favor of wonderful, amazing technological advancements that weren't actually working in the wild. So can you just talk about how the discourse around those forms of carbon capture and removal systems has really changed. Because just from an outside an interested observer's perspective, I've really noticed the space change from one which is cynically approached to one that has a lot more focus and energy. I'm just curious what your perspective is on it. There's a, a concern that I think is completely valid that a lot of companies are making these net zero commitments where essentially they're saying we're going to get to zero emissions and we can do that potentially by mitigating carbon, having greater efficiency, or by getting a bunch of offsets. And usually they'll try to do both, but often offsets, the way that they're priced right now in the market, um, for the most part, is is more economical. So cheaper and sorry, to do that. Not to not to interrupt, but to actually interrupt. Can you define <laughs> offsets? You said it a couple of times and now I have to ask. No, of course. So an offset is the idea that let's say on an individual basis. So Marshall, you fly from New York, Brooklyn to San Francisco, and you want, you, you know that that is emitting some number of carbon into the air, um, tons of carbon, right? And then you want to offset that amount of carbon for maybe just yourself or the whole airplane. And you go on, online and you search up offsets. And a lot of these companies will say, we'll plant these trees for you, or we'll do something else that, 
essentially tries to claim to permanently is when it should be good to permanently take the carbon that you emitted by flying on that airplane, right? Or that was emitted by flying in the airplane and taking that out of the air and, and storing that permanently. And so that's what an offset is. And the problem and the concern there is that instead of thinking about how do we, again, reduce emissions and actually stop emitting carbon that will rely on offsets that often have this, a few problems. One is it shifts our focus from mitigating emissions to this thing that may or may not actually be that impactful. And the reason why I say that is, is some offsets are awesome. Some carbon removal technologies are great. But some of them haven't proven that they have this concept called additivity, which is the idea that like maybe you bought an offset that or, or bought this land with 100 trees that were planted and those trees were going to be planted anyway. So you just paid someone to, to plant trees. And so it wasn't additive in any way. The thing that I that really gets me is like a, a net zero carbon commitment doesn't really make sense unless maybe you're an oil company, right? Or a coal company that's still emitting coal. You're never going to stop emitting carbon. And so sure, say that you're going to go net zero and offset all of that. But I think companies should be focused way more on zero carbon commitments. And I've seen Google take that way more seriously than some other companies. But the idea there is that you can't get out of the hole by paying other companies to offset your emissions. You actually have to get to a carbon zero world, even just within your company. And, and that makes, I think, probably a much bigger difference and also is a much better signal to the market that this is possible and that you're taking climate change seriously. It's just funny. I, the way you're describing it, I know it doesn't literally work this way, but it just seems kind of Ponzi scheme adjacent if all you're doing is shifting offsets around at scale. Is, can, you, can you correct my initial reaction if that's I mean, that's obviously incorrect, but can you just give a reaction to what I'm suggesting? My reaction is sometimes it is a Ponzi scheme. And, and I want to be very clear that not every offset company or not certainly not every carbon removal company is a Ponzi scheme, but there's enough uncertainty in the market right now. And it's hard enough for an individual consumer to find out what offset company is actually reliable and would be additive so that you know I can feel like this is actually a, uh, an offset. It's truly reducing the amount of carbon that that is out there. I do really like, and one thing I want to note on the positive end is that Stripe, I think, has done an awesome job on the carbon removal side of things. They chose to not use the general offset market, but to do some research and figure out what carbon removal technologies are there out there that where the science behind it is actually very sound. And there are great, there's great research around it and great experts around it. But the price per ton of carbon is instead of $10 for, for some offsets that may or may not be iffy, it's maybe $600 per carbon ton. And so they have allocated, their, it's, it's probably more now, but they allocated their first million dollars to just buying those tons of carbon from carbon removal companies. So they didn't invest in them, they, they were a customer of them. And what that allowed for was the economy of scale there, where you know a lot of companies weren't willing to spend $600 per carbon ton because that just didn't, you know, it didn't look as good. Okay. We only offset, you know, 30 tons of carbon instead of an order of magnitude more, but start didn't care about that. They wanted to put this million dollars behind it. And they actually saw economies of scale start already with that kind of small number um, of money behind these new carbon removal technologies. So I have a lot of faith in carbon removal as a space and in the science behind it. Um, I think it can make a huge impact. And the IPCC says that it you know, could be a key factor in actually keeping us below two degrees Celsius. But I do have some skeptical when you know, a company says, I'm going to be net zero by 2050. First of all, 2050 is a long, long way away. And two, net zero is not enough. Zero carbon is, is where we have to be thinking. And that's actually the perfect transition to the actual technical solutions that we're focused on. So in the other podcast that we keep referencing... We're talking about renewable energy, zero emissions tra transportation, reducing um, the impact of buildings and infrastructure. Can you just walk through the framework so we could understand the actual landscape that we're talking about, especially from the perspective of focusing on 2030 that you said earlier instead of the 2050? So you're right. There's renewable energy, 
transportation, regenerative agriculture, industrial processes, um, analytical and behavior change is, is, is another one. I've become more convinced recently by just the more that I learn that there's so much room, there are all these different levers for change, right? We talked about policy as one, and we talked about corporate change as another. We talk about consumers driving those pieces as another. But the three that I want to talk about from a sort of technical innovation perspective is there's moonshot technology. That's, you know, technology that may or may not work. A lot of carbon removal may or may not work unless it's proven out. You know, just a million examples of moonshot technology that, you know, Gates and, and Breakthrough Ventures is backing. Um, then there's kind of incremental tech or business model innovation, which is scaling current technology. And that I'm becoming more and more convinced is where a lot of the opportunities in this space are and a lot of the impact is. So we're thinking about how do we actually get to carbon zero? It's really with a ton of renewables, a ton of batteries and storage opportunities, maybe some nuclear or a lot of nuclear, we're not sure yet. But in all these cases, it's it's more of a scaling problem and, and the incremental tech improvement than in a business model innovation side, then like thinking about a moonshot, tech, moonshot technology that will make a huge difference there. And the last thing that I'm super interested in in this climate tech space is financial innovation. And it's sort of this merging, merging of fintech and climate tech. And so Saul Griffith um, interviewed him the other day for our fellowship, and he is really interested in this idea of a climate mortgage. And he's, his catchphrase, it's um, electrify everything. And it's so clear how hard it is to electrify homes and electrify cities. It's just, it's such a big infrastructure problem, but there are also so many opportunities for companies that are able to unlock having EV charging on every corner, right? Especially of low-income communities, because that's such a barrier to a low-income community having an electric car, right? Right now, it's it's for people who are rich and live in rich areas, or at least have rich neighborhoods, right? Quick Where they thing, can charge it. That's interesting. Yeah. Is the is the issue with electric vehicles that there aren't enough chargers in low income communities, or is it the cars themselves are expensive? Because I think the, I feel I feel those are two different things. Maybe I'm wrong. Totally, and, and they're both they're both really big problems, right? And so if you can actually innovate on the upfront cost, but also innovate on the charging, then you've solved it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the. So, so this idea of a climate mortgage, idea of project finance being a really big lever in helping tech solutions actually scale and make a huge impact. Um, I, I think we're always going to have to innovate on batteries. They're always going to get better incrementally or hopefully by leaps and bounds. But I'm just more, I'm becoming way more interested in some of the business model innovations and the financial innovations that can help us scale the technologies that we already have, in addition to always funding Moonshot technologies, because those might make those bigger changes that will help us with leaps and bounds of uh, getting leaps and bounds ahead. To what degree, because what I find interesting is that you came at this originally from a pure policy perspective, right? You read an IPCC report and that drove your interest in the space. It wasn't as if you were searching for investment opportunities and then pivoted into this. To what degree do you think there is, because this is often what people will say, that there is a trade-off between focusing on these market-oriented projects and just action itself on climate change from a policy perspective. What do you think about that argument that people often get into? I think we don't need either ors. I think it's a yes and. It's a complex space. We need systems thinking. We need to understand the larger system. And I, I mean, I run a climate tech fellowship, right? Like I am completely bought into the fact that, or the idea that there are all these different levers. One of them is entrepreneurship, whether that's technical innovation or business model, model innovation, and that that's going to make a huge difference in the larger scheme. Like I am in this for impact and this is how I'm choosing, choosing to make my impact. At the same time, I see that policy is a huge lever and, and all these other pieces are, are huge levers. And so, um, you know, I think about, Again, this yes and, it's a systems level approach and you actually, it creates feedback loops once you're working on one thing and the other, right? When, when you're working on all these different pieces, it, it creates a stronger foundation. And so social innovation is something I think a lot about. Gender equity is another thing I think a lot about. So just integrating communities and having better schools is actually going to be helpful 
in climate tech. Having better science literacy is going to be helpful in climate tech. Um, across the world, there, there's a lot of research around gender equity and how that affects climate, both in terms of how women are most effective, affected by climate, but also once you give women more agency and empowerment, then like they emit less. Like it, it literally has this tangible effect on climate emissions. And so I don't think that we should be just focusing on social innovations, financial innovations, technical innovations, or policy. I think we should be focusing on different things. And that's why it gets really overwhelming, Marshall, right? Like I thought I was going to work on the ethics of AI, get a PhD in statistics, and then I decided to pivot into environmentalism and climate. And I wanted to find a community of, of interesting people with different expertise who could really help me understand, like, what is this giant complex space? And the best advice that I got is just whatever I'm interested in and whatever I think I'm good at to focus on that being the lever that I pull, right? There are all these fucking different levers. There are all these talented, incredible people in the climate space who should be in the climate space and millions more that are not in the climate space that will be. Um, in five or 10 years, if we're not just a, a climate tech economy, then, then that's a sign of failure, right? So we're just gonna need a ton more people. But I really believe that we just need all of our backgrounds and all of our expertise, but also all of our interests. And right now I'm firmly committed to entrepreneurship and, and to using this as my lever, but, I, but I'm not going to ignore that there are other viable, incredibly important levers as well. I wanna get to the community part because I actually think that integrating diverse, unique perspectives, inputs is so valuable in this space in a way that isn't true, even in other spaces that we're covering it on deck. But I want to ask you something around jobs creation, because that's something you've discussed. But I think what's been interesting, because this also falls into the clean tech versus climate tech 10, 20 year bit, is that the jobs picture in terms of from this new technology has been really interesting. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the topic as we were discussing before the start of the episode. Job creation is incredibly important for so many reasons. One is we need jobs, right? It's just on a very tangible, like a practical level. We just need jobs, right? And the second piece is because we need jobs, it is the most important messaging or marketing it's sort of a cynical way to put it, but but really, if we can talk about the climate crisis, less about what we what we take away from people, right? If we can talk about like electric vehicles act actually drive better than gas powered vehicles, a smart thermostat is just better than your the thermostat that was there before, right? Like these new technologies in climate tech are are better than what we had before, and there is a world where we get to live a fantastic life, and we are not in the climate crisis, right? We've, we've figured out how to get out of that. So that's my bit on optimism, but, but going to jobs, climate people have just been bad marketers in the past and we need better marketers, right? So if you're a marketing person, come join climate because we need you. But I think one of the, the, best, the best descriptions of how this can be, you know, climate tech can just be this incredible game changer for people across the country and across the world. But let's, let's think about the U.S., is that there's all this talk about you know oil and gas and and people in, in coal and legacy energy fields losing their jobs, and if we can communicate like Saul Griffith did in, in rewiring America's report, Block Power is proving out as a startup that that they're creating green jobs in the private sector even more than the, the public sector. But rewiring America has this uh, put out this this report that said that you know, if we can decarbonize the U.S. by 2035, we're actually creating 25 million jobs across the country and saving the average household $2,000. So if we can reframe this, right? This, these are true. This is <laughs> that, like, I, I would trust Saul with my statistics. These are true statements. And if we can shift the dialogue from we're taking away jobs to we're actually creating millions of jobs. And by the way, those aren't jobs where everyone needs a PhD. A lot of those are skilled technician jobs that you know, people don't need degrees in necessarily. They'll, they'll need to be reskilled probably, but those are local jobs that are hard to offshore. And so that brings me a lot of hope. And I also hope that the climate community gets better at marketing. The fact that if we make this transition, there'll be way more jobs than there won't be. Um, Saul said something the other day, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was something about how like a majority of the jobs in oil and gas are actually people selling you things at gas stations, right? Like it's this like wildly inflated number 
because of all of those folks at gas stations. But that the, the the number of jobs that will be created is again magnitudes higher than any that will be potentially taken away. So back to the question of community, you've run a cohort of the fellowship, and you'd mentioned that before you came to On Deck, you actually thought about doing a program or process on your own initiative around this. Um, Shilling for the program aside, I'm just actually curious, as someone who's been thinking about this space and recognizes the need to be really intersectional with different groups, what have just your learnings been when you're bringing together different folks? It just seems that that is a necessary thing to do in this space in a way that maybe isn't quite as true, let's say in health tech or in a more traditional software focused set of the business that OnTech really focuses on. I'm curious like about your actual experience bringing together people in the ecosystem. So in climate, and I actually think it's it's not so far off from health where you do need different types of practitioners, regulatory experts, investment ex- experts of different kinds. But I, I know climate really well. And so in climate, we need people with PhDs who are you know, the world's foremost experts in certain technologies or, or niches of tech um, and of climate. So people with PhDs, people with 20 plus years of clean energy experience, maybe in oil and gas and utilities, because those skills are actually really applicable in the climate tech world and in having a just transition to a more sustainable economy. But we also want, let's take advisors. So we want people who are policy experts, understand the regulatory framework. And then on the investment side, there's so many different types of investment actually in climate. So it's not just VCs, right? It's, it's or deep tech VCs or SaaS VCs. Um, that can be one big pile of, of people. There's also project finance. There's also uh, Prime Coalition, which is this whole other sort of model of, of taking family office money and investing it into climate and also, you know, providing grants and there's government grants. There's there's all these different pieces and ways to get money. And so my learning on this is that, oh, and then the last category of people that's actually incredibly important are the people who have skills in building, you know, sometimes billion dollar companies and in other industries who want to do the same in climate or people who have, you know, software engineering backgrounds or professors at Ivy Leagues and now want to use those skills in climate. And those skills are incredibly important, right? Marketers, like I said, it was, it was sort of tongue in cheek, but I'm being completely serious. Like we need more marketers in climate. We haven't done a good job of, of that field in climate or that, that expertise in climate. And so what I've learned by bringing together these different types of people is that one, I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that it's so important to break down the silos of these individual communities into one larger community in climate tech. They learn so much from each other from people with complementary skills and backgrounds. And I believe, and we've proven it out a little bit, we'll, we'll prove it out even more in the years to come, but when we have people of different backgrounds coming together to start organizations or companies, my thought is it's so much more likely to be a company that makes an impact, is, is scalable, and therefore makes an even bigger impact. And so that's, that's my bet, is that br- by bringing together these different types of experts, we're creating better companies that make bigger impacts. So the big two last questions here, I would like to just go over the specific tech spaces and opportunities that folks should be looking at as they're moving into this space. Because I think we've done a really good job of giving folks a mental framework for thinking about the issue and the opportunity, but I want to actually go through them. So sitting in the year, and I've got the list here, sitting in the year 2021, could you describe the state and opportunity in the renewable energy sector? For renewable energy, I believe that the biggest opportunities are in scaling the technologies that are available today. With scaling it, you're going to have incremental increases and uh, incremental um, improvements in the technology, right? Economies of scale, you'll, you'll get cheaper prices. But to me, it's really about scaling the current technology and creating new business models that allow us to scale even more quickly than we are today, because we need to scale way more quickly than we are today. So that's that's the number one opportunity in renewable energy that I see. The others for renewable energy are probably also nuclear. I, I think there's opportunity there. And again, that's a business model innovation to make it more affordable than it is today. What about zero emission transportation? 
talked a bit about it earlier with EVs and being able to charge them everywhere. I think that is going to be super helpful. There are harder types of transportation to create with zero emissions. And so there's a company called, I believe, Heart Aerospace. So they're electrifying regional air travel, right? Like electrifying an airplane is an incredibly hard problem and they have figured out a way to do that well. And so in zero emissions transportation, I think it's one, getting charging stations all over, two, electrifying some of the harder transportation options like trucks are really hard to electrify as well as airplanes. This is a good game. Next one, uh, buildings and infrastructure. I am so impressed with Block Block Power. It's Donnell Baird. It is an incredible company that marries climate justice and equity with the climate crisis and, and trying to fix it. And so he has software that is able to, based on the type of building that we're talking about, and it's mostly commercial buildings, to understand what we're probably dealing with that is required when we're retrofitting that building. And so is there going to be lead in that building, for example? And I believe 40% of the infrastructure bill actually will go to low-income buildings or low-income communities that are most likely to have lead and and really awful, unhealthy um, chemicals. And so they just do a great job of, of, again, marrying climate justice and and climate, but also using software in a very hard tech sort of space. and so I think that's an incredible opportunity because they're creating jobs. They are, you know, making an, an actual impact. Uh, the bigger thing is really electrifying buildings. And again, that that requires some policy change, but really it's just a lot of different opportunities in electrifying buildings. Sustainable agriculture. This is such an interesting space. I, I think the number one, I don't know if this is this counts as an opportunity, but in this space, it's so important to understand the space and the customers and the farmers. Um, I And also to partner with local communities, sometimes indigenous communities, to take equity really, really seriously here. here. So biochar is really hot. That's, that's a hot opportunity today in the sustainable agriculture space. Um, there's also a way to, to, and I think actually across the board, and again, my background is, is a bit in machine learning, but there's a way to So you can use machine learning and AI when it comes to measuring soil health, for example. So there's an opportunity there. Um, There's an opportunity in creating plants actually that are more resilient and able to potentially suck more carbon out of the air or to create more wheat or create more of whatever whatever the plant or the food is. Um, A lot of opportunities in, in fake meat. So alternatives for meat, that is a huge, huge amount of carbon emissions. So lots of, lots of opportunities in the space. And for the last two, we've got the analytics and behavior change, and then just decarbonizing industrial processes. Decarbonizing industrial processes is a lot about infrastructure. And so as we decarbonize buildings and infrastructure, it'll be easier to decarbonize industrial processes. But actually, there's a huge opportunity in thinking about cement and steel production. Those, those take up or, or produce actually way more carbon than, than I knew a year ago. And there are some really, really interesting companies coming out, including Sublime. Leah is, is starting an incredible company with that. And so that's cement and steel production, really interesting there. Very hard problem, but, but one that's worthwhile. And then analytics and behavior change, um, in my head, that's aggregating consumer demand. So many people reach out to me and ask, what can I do about climate? And besides joining a climate tech company, thinking about starting a company, um, aggregating our consumer demand or helping to aggregate consumer demand or consumer demands around policy even, or local policy and helping people understand how they can make a difference there. I think that's an incredible lever of change and an incredible opportunity to bring together the power of the individual, actually to bring together the power of, of communities, not just individuals. So for the last question, you did a really great job of describing how the current climate tech space comes out of the ashes of the clean tech movement's failures in the 2000s. What would you say the bull and the bear case is R for the climate tech space in the 2020s. What goes right? What goes wrong? And then quick thing, people hate predictions. So I'm not asking for a prediction. I'm saying if you just were to game out 
the optimism and the pessimism in the space? What can you see going right and what can you see going wrong? That's a fantastic question. What I can see going right is us moving more quickly than we think is possible. Think about World War II, right? Where we went from creating almost no war vehicles to creating millions of war vehicles, right? Like it's just, we are able to do so much so quickly. And I have a certain level of stubborn optimism that we will move more quickly than we we even think is possible today. So that's my piece of optimism. My piece of pessimism is that I worry about the people, the communities, and the ecosystem, like the environmental ecosystems that we leave behind. Climate and the climate crisis is different than environmentalism and ecosystem uh, rehabilitation or maintenance, right? And so we might live in a world that is only two, two degrees Celsius warmer. So we've hit that and, and we did a great job and we stepped up to the challenge, but we might have no coral reefs or we might have, you know, far fewer forests than we have today and far fewer large mammals that are beautiful and that we want our children to see and our, you know, seven generations down to see. And if there's a way to do both, I'll be ecstatic, right? If we can solve the climate crisis, but also maintain the level of beauty in nature that we have, not just today, but, you know, a hundred years ago, um, but, but today at a minimum, then, then I'll be thrilled. Just understand that, you know, people are resilient and also our ecosystem is as resilient, at least as people are. That gives me a lot of hope. And then the idea of interdependence gives me a lot of hope. And so we are realizing that we are more interconnected than we could even imagine, right? That it, a couple of examples that come to mind are understanding that trees' root systems talk to each other, right? Like in scientific terms, they talk to each other. Um, a lot of that is through through fungi. And it's just, it's like incredible and mind-blowing and beautiful to know that that's actually happening and, and has been scientifically proven. And I'm probably butchering, you know, exactly what, how to say it, but like, it, you know, fundamentally that's actually true. And then the second, so that's like incredible and, and great. And we're learning, you know, how interconnected we are through that, but also we're learning how interconnected we are through on the East coast, seeing the sun and, and seeing it blaze red and wondering why it's blazing red and knowing that that's coming from West Coast fires, right? And that's just within the US. And so go to the global South and understand that a lot of the climate disasters that are happening there are, are not their fault, right? It's it's the fault of countries that have been emitting for many, many years. And um, people in the global South and, and the poor and people of the global majority actually are the ones who are paying the price. But I think the the optimistic note is that in a philosophical way, we're understanding how interconnected we are, how interdependent we are. And I think that that can only mean that we're going to very quickly, you know, pull our pants up and, and really hopefully solve the climate crisis in whatever way we can today. That is exactly the note I actually wanted to end on. Candice, thank you so much for joining. Where can everyone find your work? Thank you, Marshall. Uh, I'm not big on Twitter. I usually retweet people. So if one wa someone wants to teach me how to use Twitter, I'm at C Amori, C A M M O R I. You can email me at Candice at beyonddeck.com if you want to learn more about on deck. Um, and I should start writing. So this is a good a good reason to start writing is is because I don't have great answers of how you can find me. But th those are two places. Well, I know that this has been a really great conversation, and we'll definitely be having another version of it soon. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for joining us in the deep end. If you enjoyed your stay, give us a review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with your friends and colleagues to help grow the show with us. We've also got show notes and more episodes available at ideas.beyonddeck.com. See you next time.